Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be going over care for the postpartum patient. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, and press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. A couple other things, but don't forget guys, I'm now um, doing next generation NCLEX reviews. It's a quick review where I go over the meat and the potatoes. If you've been following me for any amount of time, you know I skip all the fat. I want to go to what's most important for you to know. So I cover the types of questions you should expect to be seen, how to answer those questions, even when you don't know what the right answer is, how to find cues and clues to figure out what the correct answer choice is. You can book on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And always, I have a, uh, audio lessons available on my website as well. If you're currently in the program, you're not ready to take NCLEX, but you're struggling. You're in the program right now and you need a really high grade on your next exam. Check out the audio lessons that I have available. Again, audio lessons and you could book for your NCLEX review on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Guys, one more thing. Don't forget, almost daily, you guys can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And I don't know how long, you know, we're going to have TikTok. So just in case, make sure you guys keep following me here on YouTube, and my other social media platforms, but hopefully we can keep TikTok. All right, guys, before we get started, I want to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, that's fine. Just go ahead and fast forward. And if you are, close your eyes by your head, unless you're driving or operating heavy machinery. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us, Father God. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies, Lord. Thank you for all of our blessings that we take for granted, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father God, I ask for forgiveness for our sins, Lord. I know we fall short of your glory every single moment, but Lord, thank you so much that you love us so much. All we have to do is ask for forgiveness and it's already been given. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for all you've done. Jesus, I ask, please, as we go over this information, Father God, I pray for every viewer, every person that's listening, every person that's watching, Father God, for whatever reason they came to this channel. Lord, I ask that you please help them. Help them in abundance, Lord. Help them to be able to understand the nursing material. Help them to be able to process their thoughts and be able to think critically and answer the questions appropriately, Lord. And when they get that license, I ask that you please allow them to be a blessing to others. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you'll continue to do for us in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. When developing the plan of care for a preemie pairs client during the first 12 hours after vaginal delivery, which of the following concerns of the client should be the nurse's primary focus of care? One, the neonate. Two, the family. Three, the client's own comfort. Or four, the client's significant other. And guys, number three is the correct answer the client's own comfort go back to the question it says that you're caring for who a preemie parents client not the newborn right so your focus of care is going to be on your patient not the patient's family not the spouse and as much as we love the newborn the newborn has their own nurse your focus needs to be on your patient number three is the correct answer choice the nurse assesses a swollen ecchymose area to the right of an episiotomy on a preemie pairs client six hours after vaginal delivery. The nurse should next, one, apply an ice pack to the perineal area, two, assess the client's temperature, three, have the client take a warm sits bath, or four, contact the physician for orders for an antibiotic. And guys, the correct answer is choice number one. When it comes to postpartum care, the time frame tells us a lot, and that's very important. So let's make sure we pay attention. If you go back to the question, it says that the patient has a swollen ecchymose area. It's to the right side of that episiotomy, and it's been six hours. Well, guess what, guys? We want to apply ice to that swollen, painful, edematous area the first 24 hours right? After 24 hours, that's when we want to give them that um, warm moisture such as a sits bath. But within that first 24 hours, it's ice. And so since it's been six hours, we're going to apply ice to the perennial area. That's going to help with the pain. It's going to help with the swelling. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. Two, assess the client's temperature. Now, isn't that a beautiful answer? It's always good. You always want to assess your patient, but I tell you guys this all the time. Don't get tricked. Don't choose a beautiful answer 
if it doesn't answer your question. So yes, assessing a patient, checking their temperature, their vitals, that's always a good thing to do. But does it apply to this specific situation? Is that the next thing you're gonna do when they tell you it's been six hours, patients, and what we're looking at right here is a hematoma. They've got a pocket of blood next to that episiotomy it's a hematoma, what are you going to do? Checking that temperature, what's that temperature going to tell you? First of all, go back to the time. It's only been six hours. So it's not like the patient's had time to develop um, some kind of infection, right? Or a large infection. We're not seeing any signs and symptoms of infection. We're not seeing uh, the redness or um, the warmth at the site. No, we're suspecting a hematoma. So yes, we want to check their vitals, but that's not the next thing you want to do. You want to address the problem. And the problem right now is that hematoma. Three, have them um, have the client have a warm sits bath. That's going to be after 24 hours. Remember right now, this is a six hour mark. And four, contact the physicians for an antibiotic. Why? We give antibiotics for bacterial infections. We don't see anything here that's saying bacterial infection. So the correct answer choice, guys, is number one, the ice pack. And what should have led you to it, the two things. The first one, swollen ecchymose area next to the episiotomy, a collection of blood next to that site. That's, that's um, a hematoma, right? That's the first clue. And the second clue was how long? Six hours. Most likely there's not an infectious process going on yet. Two hours after vaginally delivering a viable male neonate under epidural anesthesia, the client with a midline at the episiotomy ambulates to the bathroom to void. After voiding, the nurse assesses the client's bladder, finding it distended. The nurse interprets this finding based on the understanding that the client's bladder distension is most likely caused by which of the following? Prolonged first stage of labor, urinary tract infection, pressure of the uterus on the bladder, or edema in the lower urinary tract area. And guys, the correct answer is four. Edema in the lower urinary tract area. Go back to the question. It's two hours. It's only been two hours, so it's too early for us to be thinking about infection, right? It says two hours after the va um, vag, so she gave birth vaginally, and the patient has a mid midline episiotomy. So what's happening? It's been two hours since she had vaginal birth. There's been a lot of trauma to that area. You expect for there to be trauma, for there to be swelling, and all of that can cause that urinary um, retention. Think about it. Trauma to that lower um, um, urinary tract, she just gave birth vaginally. All of that swelling can cause the woman to hold on to um, urine in the bladder and that will cause a urinary retention. Look at the wrong answer choices. One, prolonged first stage of labor. If the first stage of labor is prolonged, that can cause the mother to be excessively fatigued. That can even cause uterine acne. And with uterine acne, we're gonna be concerned about bleeding, right? But that's not the situation here. We're concerned because she said she had a urinate. She went to urinate, she came back. We assessed the bladder and it's still distended. There's still urine in the bladder. What can be causing that? So it can't be a prolonged stage of labor. Choice two, urinary tract infection. Again, go back to the question. It's only been two hours. There hasn't been enough time for her to develop an infection. So that can't be the answer. Let's keep going. Three, pressure of the uterus on the bladder. What pressure? The uterus is empty. She gave birth. There's no fetus in the uterine, in the uterus that's pushing on the bladder anymore. So what pressure? Absolutely not. The correct answer is four. Again, this was something traumatic to the body. So all of that swelling, all of that uh, 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 accumulation of fluid, that can compress the bladder and cause that patient to have urinary retention where they're not emptying the bladder all the way, okay? So the correct answer choice is number four. A preemie Paris client who's bottle feeding her neonate 12 hours after birth asks the nurse, when will my menstrual cycle return? Which of the following responses by the nurse would be most appropriate? One, your menstrual cycle return in three to four weeks. Two, in six to 10 weeks. Uh, three, 12 to 14 weeks. Or four, 16 to 18 weeks. And guys, the correct answer is two. It will probably return six to 10 weeks before it starts again. What was the key in the question that should have led us to the correct answer choice? Go back to the question. 
da da da. It says she's bottle feeding. There's a difference of when the menses returns if you're lactating versus if you're not lactating. So the fact that um, she's bottle feeding, which means she's not lactating, we expect her menses to come back a lot sooner, which is at six to 10 weeks. Now, let's say she was um, breastfeeding. She was breastfeeding, which means she's still lactating. We expect it to be a little bit longer. It would be choice number three, 12 to 14 weeks. Uh, actually 12 to 16 weeks. That's your time range. If you're actually breastfeeding, you're lactating. But the fact that she's bottle feeding and we know she's not lactating, it's going to be a lot less, which is your six to 10 weeks. Now, choice number one is wrong because it's just too early. And then choice number four is wrong because 16 to 18 weeks, that's not the range that's too long. If you're breastfeeding, we expect it to be 12 to 16 weeks. If you're not breastfeeding, we expect it to be about six to 10 weeks. So that's why uh, number two is the correct answer choice. While the nurse is preparing to assist the preemie Paris client to the bathroom to avoid six hours after vaginal delivery under epidural anesthesia, the client says that she feels dizzy when sitting up on the side of the bed. The nurse explains that this is most likely caused by which of the following? One, effects of the anesthetic, of the anesthetic during labor. Two, hemorrhage during the delivery process. Three, effects of analgesics used during labor. Or four, decreased blood volume in the vascular system. And the correct answer is four, decreased blood volume in the vascular system. This woman just gave birth. It's, let's see how long. It's been six hours since she had vaginal delivery. So she's lost a lots of fluids, lots of fluids, fluid electrolytes, lots of blood. So there's gonna be decreased perfusion to the organs, including what? The brain, the patient can get dizzy. Decreased volume to the vascular system. That's the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices, guys. One, effects of uh, the anesthetic during labor. Guys, if the patient gets an uh, epidural anesthetic, that will last for about one to two hours afterwards. Go back to the time frame. How long has it been? Six hours. So it can't be the epidural. Now look how they try to trick you because they let you know, yeah, she had vaginal delivery. They gave her epidural. They threw that epidural there to distract you, but you got to pay attention to the time frame. It's been six hours. The epidural lasts one to two hours afterwards. So it can't be the epidural. Two, hemorrhage during the delivery process. There's nothing in this question that tells us that that patient has been hemorrhaging out. There's nothing that tells us that um, the, the fundus is soft or boggy, that the patient's losing a lot of blood, that the blood pressure is down, that the heart rate is up, that the respirations have increased. There's nothing giving us a signal that that's what the patient's experiencing, that the patient's hemorrhaging, right? So that can't be it. Choice three, effects of analgesics during labor. Um, if the patient got analgesics during labor, it still wouldn't last six hours. And let's say the patient had a local anesthetic. Well, the local anesthetic only lasts for about an hour. So what we're, we're, we're concerned about, what we're, we're, I don't want to say the word assuming, but what we understand is happening, there's been a huge fluid shift from giving birth, losing all those fluids, electrolytes, uh, um, blood, that there's decreased perfusion, and that can cause hypotension, that can cause dizziness. And so that's what's going on with this patient here. Number four is the correct answer choice. The nurse enlists the aid of an interpreter when caring for a preemie Paris client from Mexico who speaks very little English and delivered a viable term neonate eight hours ago. When developing the postpartum dietary plan care for the client, the nurse will encourage the client's intake of which of the following? One, tomatoes, two, potatoes, three, corn products, or four, meat products. And the correct answer, guys, is for meat products. As I've just explained, when you give birth, you lose a lot of fluids, including blood, right? So why would we encourage her to eat meat products? Meat products is high in what? Um, I was about to say protein. That's not what I want to say. Um, iron. It's high in iron, iron that you lost during uh, um, the birth because you lost so much blood. So you can encourage the patient to eat 
foods that are high in iron. You're going to teach them to eat like organ meats. You're going to teach them to eat green leafy veggies. Why? Because they are high in iron stores and they'll help replace the iron that she lost during uh, delivery. Three hours postpartum, a preemie pair's client fundus is firm and midline. On perennial inspection, the nurse observes a small constant trickle of blood. Which of the following conditions should the nurse assess further? One, retain placental tissue. Two, uterine inversion. Three, bladder distension. Or four, perennial lacerations. What do you guys think? And guys, the correct answer is for perennial lacerations. We know that it's not the fundus. The fundus is firm. It's midline, right? If it was soft, it was boggy, then we suspect, okay, that's where bleeding is coming from. But if you go back to the question, it says that the fundus is firm and midline. So we know the bleeding can't be coming from the fundus. Um, and it says the patient has a constant trickle of blood. So there's tiny little trickling of blood. Where is it coming from? Look at choice two, uterine inversion. That's the uterus coming outside of the vagina. Guess what? In the question, it tells us that the, you as a nurse, you did an assessment. That is something that's very obvious. You would know if that uterus was outside the vagina. So that can't be it. Choice three, um, bladder distension. If the bladder was distended, the fundus wouldn't be midline. It'd shift off to the side. That's how you know the patient has a full bladder. So that can't be it because if you go back to the question, it tells you that the bladder is firm and what? Midline. It's not deviated to the side. So it's not, a, it's not a full bladder. What can it be? Laceration. Perennial little cut in the perennial area. And that's what's causing that constant trickle of blood for the correct answer. You're going to suspect like a perennial tear, maybe even like a, a cervical laceration. At a postpartum checkup 11 days after delivery, the nurse asked the client about the color of her lochia. Which of the following colors is expected? One, dark red, two, pink, three, brown, or four, white? And the correct answer, guys, is white. It's 11 days. After, from 10 days on, you should expect it to be um, white or clear. That's your Lokia Alba. Now, let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, dark red. You see that during the first day to about the third day. And then two, pink, three, brown. Pink, brown, you see that around three to 10 days. And then once you hit 10 days, it should start turning clear or white. So that's why number four is the correct answer. After instructing a preemie parents client about episiotomy care, which of the following client statements indicates successful teaching? One, I'll use hot sudsy water to clean the episiotomy area. Two, I'll wipe the area from front to back using a blotting motion. Three, before bedtime, I'll use cold water sis bath. Or four, I can use ice pack for three to four days after delivery. And the only correct answer is two, wiping from front to back because you want to decrease contamination and blotting. You want to pack, not wipe because you don't want to cause more trauma to that site. So two is the correct answer. Now let's talk about why the other choices are wrong. One, I'll use hot. Stop right there. What do you think of when you think of hot? Burns. You don't want the patient to be burned. Choice three, before bedtime, I'll use cold sits water. No, we want um, those sits water, is, we want it warm. That warmth, moisture, that's what causes the soothing for um, the woman just gave birth. And then four, I can use ice packs for, look at the day, look at the amount of time, three to four days. Remember, we use ice the first 24 hours, and then after that, we use warmth. The sits bath would be used for three to four days after, not um, ice. That's why two is the correct answer choice. After explaining the procedure for using a portable sits bath to a preemie Paris client who delivered 30 hours ago, which of the following would the nurse do next? One, fill the collecting bag with water at a temperature of 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Two, spray the perennial area with the ordered analgesic spray. Three, wash hands and don gloves for the procedure. Or four, assess the client's perineum for swelling and redness. And guys, the correct answer is three, wash hands and put on gloves. And I know how some of you guys are tricked 
You want it to go with assess because everything's assess, assess, assess. Well, yeah, you always want to assess first. But remember, um, you need to wash your hands and put on gloves whenever you expect to possibly come in contact with bodily fluids such as blood, urine, feces, vomitus, sputum, right? So when you do that assessment of the perennial area where that patient still obviously is bleeding, don't you expect to come into contact with bodily fluids? Yeah. So before you can even assess your patient, you got to do what? Wash your hands and put on gloves, okay? Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, that temperature of 107 is way too hot. Your range is going to be from about 100 degrees Fahrenheit to 105, no more than that. Two, spray the perennial area with the ordered analgesics. That's after the sits bath. After she's had that calming, soothing sits bath, then you're going to put on a spray. Choice four, assessing the perennial perineum for swelling and redness. You absolutely want to do that before the sits bath, but you're going to do that after you wash your hands and put on gloves. A multi pairs client whose fundus is firm and midline at the umbilicus eight hours after vaginal delivery tells the nurse that when she ambulates to the bathroom after sleeping for four hours, her dark red locus seems heavier. Which of the following would the nurse include in explaining to the client about the increased locus on ambulation? One, her bleeding needs to be reported to the physician immediately. Two, the increased locia occurs from locia pooling in the vaginal vault. Three, the increase in lochia may be an early sign of postpartum hemorrhage. Or four, this increase in lochia usually indicates retained placental fragments. And the correct answer is three. The increased lochia occurs from lochia pooling in the vaginal vault. So it's not that she's bleeding more, but while she's lying down, that blood just pools. But when she gets up to start walk around, it all comes down. And so it seems like she's bleeding more, but she's really not. It just pulled while she was lying down sleeping. Two is the correct answer choice. Four hours after delivering a viable neonate by spontaneous vaginal delivery under epidural anesthesia, the client states that she needs to urinate. The nurse should next. One, catheterize the client to obtain an accurate measurement. Two, palpate the bladder to determine distension. Three, assess the fundus to see if it's midline. Or four, measure the first two voidings and record them out. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is four. You're going to measure the first two voidings and record the amount. So if that patient's urinating frequently, but they're not even giving you 150 mLs, you should suspect there's urinary retention going on, right? Um, there's been a huge fluid shift, and after she gives birth, all that fluid that she was holding on to to help perf with perfusion and feed the baby, she needs to get rid of it, right? So she may be urinating a lot to get rid of the fluid, but we should at least see like 150 mLs. So if she's urinating frequently and we're not seeing 150 mLs, we're going to suspect that the patient's holding on to the urine. They're experiencing urinary retention. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, catheterize them. First of all, you understand every time you catheterize a patient or you do something invasive, you are potentially introducing pathogens. So we really don't catheterize patients unless we absolutely have to. So we are not going to know if we have to unless we do what? Assess. We need to monitor the urine to see um, the urine output to see what's going on with the patient. So number one's false. Two, palpate the bladder. You're going to palpate the bladder when? after the patient urinates. That's the only way we're going to know if they're holding on to urine. Let them urinate and then you palpate the bladder to check for distension. And then three, assess the fundus to see if it's midline. Again, after they urinate, because if the patient urinates and um, that bladder's empty, it's supposed to be empty, but the fundus is over on the side instead of midline, we're going to suspect what? the bladder's not empty because that full bladder, that's what's pushing the fundus over to the side instead of being midline. So you're going to assess it after the patient urinates. And that's why number four is the correct answer choice. A preemie Paris client who delivered vaginally eight hours ago desires to take a shower. The nurse anticipates removing, uh, excuse me, remaining nearby the client to assess for which of the following. One, fatigue, two, fainting, three, diuresis, or four, hygiene needs. Let's say you had no idea what the answer was. You have no clue, and you had to take a guess. What would you choose? Fainting, right? 
always say to yourself, which puts my patient in the most danger, in most harm? Feigning. They just had a baby eight hours ago. There's that huge fluid shift. That patient can have hypotension. Perfusions decrease to their organs, including the brain. They may get dizzy. They may faint. Safety. That's what we're going to be concerned about. To the correct answer choice. A preemie Paris client who delivered 12 hours ago under epidural anesthesia with a midline episiotomy tells the nurse that she's experiencing a great deal of discomfort when she sits in a chair with the baby. Which of the following instructions would be most important? One, ask for some pain medication before you sit down. Two, squeeze your buttock muscles together before sitting down. Three, keep a relaxed posture before sitting down with your full weight. Four, ask the physician for some analgesic cream or spray. And the correct answer is two. Your instruction to that patient needs to be to squeeze your buttock muscles together before sitting down. Why? That's going to decrease the tension on the perineal area. That's why you tell them to clench it. To, it causes that contraction, so decrease the tension. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, ask for pain medication before you sit down. So you're going to tell your patient, every time you sit down, ask me for pain medication. What's the frequency of the, this pain medication you're going to give, be giving the patient? That's number one. And number two, you know that that medication takes time to absorb. So what? When they want to sit down, they're going to ask for pain medication and then wait for it to be absorbed before they sit down. That makes absolutely no sense. Choice three, keep a relaxed posture. No, that's actually going to make it worse. That can cause more trauma, more, more um, tension, more pressure to the perineal site. And then choice four, I literally can't even. How many times have I told you not to pass a buck? Don't pass the buck. So the, your patient tells you that they're having discomfort every time they sit down and your response to your patient is gonna be, oh, ask the doctor for pain. If, first of all, let's take a step back. Let's take a step back. If anything, if anyone would be asking the doctor for a pain medication, wouldn't it be you? Why would you tell your patient to go ask the doctor how? They're going to call the doctor? They're going to wait till the doctor make their rounds? No, absolutely not. So the next thing that comes out of your mouth or instruction to that patient is going to teach them how to contract those muscles so that it decreases the tension when they sit down. An adolescent preemie Paris client, 24 hours postpartum, asked the nurse how often she can hold her baby without spoiling him. Which of the following responses would be most appropriate? One, hold him when he's fussy or crying. Two, hold him as much as you want to hold him. Three, try to hold him infrequently to avoid overstimulation. Four, you can hold him periodically throughout the day. And guys, the correct answer is two, hold him as much as you want to hold him. This is an infant. You cannot spoil them okay remember according to erickson this infant is in the trust versus mistrust this is a time that their needs need to be met including what emotional needs right so hold them cuddle them talk to them sing to them play with them as much as you want that stimulation and that love is important to that newborn infant now let's look at the wrong answer choices one hold them when he's fussy or crying so you're teaching your patient the only time to hold their child is if the child's fussy or crying. Otherwise, just leave them lying there. Absolutely not. Three, try to hold him infrequently. Not frequently, infrequently. So try not to hold him too much to avoid overstimulation. No, they need that stimulation. That's how they're learning about their environment at this age. Um, four, you can hold them periodically. That just means periodically. You know, sometimes, from time to time, throughout the day. No, hold them cuddle them, play with them, smile, sing to them as much as you want. Okay, guys, we are uh, down to our very last question. The nurse assigns an individual who is an unlicensed assistive personnel to care for the client who is one day postpartum. Which of the following would be appropriate to delegate to this person? Select all that apply. How do you treat select all that apply? As true or false? Let's go. One, changing the parental pad and reporting the drainage. True. And unlicensed assistive personnel, they absolutely can do that. All they're doing is recording and reporting. They're changing the pad, pad and they're going to report the amount. 
Two, assisting the mother to latch the infant onto the breast. False. That requires what? Teaching. You, the nurse, you're responsible for that. Not the UAP. Three, checking the location of the fundus uh, prior to ambulating the client. False. Checking that location of the fundus, that's what? That's an assessment. The unlicensed assistive personnel, that's not within their scope of practice. They have not been trained to do that. Absolutely not. That's the job of you, the nurse. Four, reinforcing good hygiene while assisting the client with washing the perineum. True. That UAP absolutely is allowed to reinforce and say, hey, remember the nurse said front to back. Hey, remember the nurse said to pat. Hey, remember the nurse said not too hot, right? Reinforcing absolutely good hygiene. Hey, the nurse said wash your hands. Choice five, discussing postpartum depression with a client who's found uh, crying. False. That's what? Teaching. That's the responsible of, responsibility of you, the nurse, not the unlicensed assistive personnel. Six, assisting the client with, ambu client with ambulation shortly after delivery. True. The unlicensed assistive personnel, they can ambulate, they can assist with ADLs, you know, they can help the patient get dressed, things like that. So absolutely. So for this question, the correct answer choice is choice number one, choice number four, and choice number six. And guys, that is it for this video. Let me know what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see me cover um, more of or more extensively. Don't forget, you can book for your NCLEX review right now on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Even if you're not studying for your boards yet, if you know somebody that is studying for their boards, if you know me, you know me and you know I'll get them right. So go ahead and tell them to check out my website and book um, a review today at nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and you guys catch me on the next video.